how are you? Doing good. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, so what's been going on? You've had a big impact in the MMA world recently. I'm trying. You know, it's funny you say that because I feel like I've slowed down a lot. It was like uh, the end of the year and I was just like, I think I need to just chill and relax <laughs> and see friends and family and not work so much. But yeah, over the past year, I've been really trying to dive into this world and I've been loving it. For sure. Yeah. What, uh, what, what got you into it? Like, did you ever compete in combat sports or anything like that? Yeah. So when I was 21, um, so that was eight years ago, um, I had a friend drag me to a gym and I was like, I don't want to go. Like, you know, I was always into working out, but I never really considered martial arts at all. And my friend was like, I really think you're going to like this. So I went and she was right. I absolutely loved it, drank the Kool-Aid right away. <laughs> And I just dove head first into it. And it was a Muay Thai kickboxing gym, to be specific. And I, uh, I just loved it. And six months later, I was fighting. And I, 13 fights later, I am still so much in love with it. And don't win every time. Win sometimes. But I train like a mother. And it's, I just fell in love with the entire atmosphere of martial arts in general. And then... I started diving more into the MMA side because, you know, I was always getting together with my friends watching UFC on Saturday nights and I was like opened to this entirely new world. Um, so basically for the past, I would say like six or so years, that's when I started getting like really serious about just following it more. And then I would say like in the past two years, I started being a journalist because of my background in radio and uh, I just wanted to merge the two and I was like, yeah, this is, this is awesome. So, uh, I've just been trying to climb the ladder and make a name for myself in that, in that realm. Yeah. That's a great story. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of talking points out of that. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> you starting, uh, in kickboxing, those 13 fights, how, how, uh, like what, what's the timeline those took place? Was it like one, two years? Ooh, yeah. So when I first started, I was so excited and hungry about it that I was probably fighting every three months or so. Mm -hmm. And then my last couple fights, I probably was taking like two a year. And then as of late, I've kind of slowed down because, you know, I'm married now and we're considering, you know, starting a family and all that good stuff. So thank you. So, you know, fighting doesn't really... <laughs> allow that um so you know it's kind of diverting my path a little bit but it's allowing me to start on the journalistic side even more which is so exciting but fight wise you know i kind of cranked them out um pretty quickly and i really hope to get back in there within the coming years and uh the scene the new england scene is so much fun um so yeah i mean when i'm not fighting i'm still training so yeah, absolutely. What uh, what promotions did you fight in? Um, right. There's a lot of good ones up in that area, that Northeast area. It, there is. So I got my start uh, with Lace Up Promotions. Uh, they are based in Syracuse, but they come down to where I'm where I'm at. I'm in Rhode Island, so they do a lot of shows in Westerly, Rhode Island. Uh, so that's where a lot of my first couple fights were. Uh, then No Boundary Fight is a big one around here in Massachusetts. I fought for them a few times. Lion Fight was super fun. I was able to do, they started doing amateur fights before the pro fights. So I got a chance to be like, you know, fighting in Foxwoods Casino. That was nuts. Um, what else? I think, oh, and then I did, um, there was one in Pennsylvania, USKA, I want to say. Okay. Um, so, you know, Couple, couple here and there, and <laughs> it, it, it's, it's been a blast. What, uh, what made you decide to kind of transition to MMA? Because I mean, nothing is like MMA, you know. When you throw in the ground yeah. game of wrestling and jujitsu, I mean, it, it sometimes cancels out kickboxing and vice versa as That's well. It. Right. Um. You know, I, I don't say I wouldn't say I train MMA. I do train kickboxing and Muay Thai primarily, and then I've started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. The, uh, last year nice. so you know i'm only a couple months in but wow is it freaking difficult <laughs> um it's like a whole new language but i think i was attracted to mma because of how it blends everything together and there's just so many nuances going on and 
you can say the same thing for kickboxing and Muay Thai, but there are certain things that you do in kickboxing that all of a sudden you can't do when you put in the ground game and the takedowns and all that stuff. So I was just fascinated by how people can blend it together and it can look so different. You know, it's like we all have the same recipe, but people are using different ingredients all the time. Yeah. And it's just, it's so cool to me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased and I tend to look at striking a little more than the ground game and the, you know, the wrestling and the jujitsu, but I'm learning to kind of view things from a different light now, um, especially as a commentator. So, um, I think MMA is just like the full package and it's just, it's just so fun to watch. Absolutely. I, uh, I personally prefer striking. I, uh, I like kickboxing and boxing as well. Um, I hear so many people though, like you said yourself, there's certain things in kickboxing that you can do. And that once you get into the cage in MMA, you can't do one of those things was like checking kicks. People always say really good yeah. kickboxers. You can't check that much. Did you notice your legs were getting kicked a little more in MMA? Um, well, so I, I've never really trained MMA. So, um, but what I've noticed is that when you spar people that are MMA fighters, um, they tend to not know what to do with leg kicks sometimes. Um, so I find myself very successful with throwing the leg kicks on people um, because maybe they don't defend it because they're so used to coming in for the takedown. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been taken down a few times with frustrated partners, but um, I truly I haven't really dove into MMA sparring just yet, so I, I don't really know. Oh, I must, I must have misheard you. I thought you said that you did a little bit of MMA after you did kickboxing. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I no, 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 that's okay. So what I was saying was like after the kickboxing um, and my fighting started to slow down, that's when I started to like really dive into just following MMA more. Oh, I and, see, I see. Yeah, and like dissecting MMA more and learning how, you know, it's just so cool how they can like blend everything together. I see. And I have so many friends in the New England circuit that are MMA fighters and I have the opportunity to spar with them because I a lot of, a part of everyone's training is going to be just the striking, right? Like you have your sparring rounds with boxing or kickboxing and then you add in your ground and ground game. So I come in a lot for friends that need somebody to do the stand up part. Mm -hmm. And that's where I get excited. And that's where you realize like, okay, you can't throw as many leg kicks or you can't throw as many knees or like stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's all about figuring out that recipe and it's, it's, it's really cool. Absolutely. Are you, uh, are you a good training partner? (laughs) I mean, I, I consider myself a very good training partner. Um, I'm always very flattered when, uh, fighters ask for me to come and help them out with, uh, some rounds or anything like that. Um, I will say, and I think, you know, the majority of fighters, we have to deal with an ego and as in life as well. And it's, it's something that's really hard to battle sometimes. Like if you're, if your partner is going really hard, you, you tend to match their pace and then sometimes it can escalate. We've all been there, but I pride myself on being a smart partner, a safe partner, but I'm going to push you because if you're asking me to do rounds with you, I'm not just going to let you tee off. Like, I'm going to give you stuff that is going to make it difficult. And I think that's why uh, people ask me to come do their camps or, you know, enjoy training with me because I do like to play it safe, but I also provide some sort of puzzle that they need to figure out. Absolutely. I uh, I might be uh, wrong on this, but you seem like someone who really enjoys like sparring and really going live with people. Um, as I far do. as uh, <laughs> as far as training goes, um, what does like a training camp look like for you? Because over throughout my time doing the podcast, I've talked to a lot of like coaches, a lot of guys who are getting into coaching and some of them really stress sparring. Some of them say they love sparring. And then some of them say, I don't even spar in a fight camp. I just hit the bag. So like, what is it for you? So my camps have definitely evolved as I've gotten more experienced or just smarter in the game. Uh, When I first started out, I was training every single day, no days off, sparring as much as possible, um, and just like grind, grind, grind. And, you know, that works for some people, but I learned over time that rest days are just as important, mental days just as important. So I think 
I'm trying to think of my last fight camp I had. I do a lot of cardio classes, just like typical bag classes. Um, pad work is super important for me. Um, I think pad work is one of the best ways to keep your fight IQ really strong and your eyes really strong. Um, and then sparring, I really don't spar more than twice a week, honestly. Um, cause if you're going, I mean, hard, but not crazy hard. Um, I think when your skills are there, so when you're getting your skills done with pad work and drills and, and, and bag work and things like that, that's, what's most important. You know, that you can go in and fight somebody if you are confident with your skills. So as I started to evolve as a fighter, my, my sparring wasn't at the forefront of my training camps. Um, it was certainly one of my favorite parts of the training camps. Uh, but I think when people start to spar a little too much, that's when accidents happen, injuries happen, and you just burn yourself out. So yeah, I mean, I do probably twice a week with sparring and then a lot of cardio, a lot of bag, and then weight training has been uh, definitely a big part that started to evolve towards the end of my kickboxing because I didn't realize how important weight training is, not only to like get you more strength, but to like keep your muscles safe and to like make sure that you feel good. And like when I started incorporating the weight training, I was like, holy shit, like I actually have abs. Like this is dope. Like it felt, it felt so good and I was so much stronger. So I would say weight training, bag work, pad work, definitely necessary. And then sparring is just like the funsies part. For sure. Uh, I mean, you seem really passionate about it, which is really cool to hear. I mean, that's always the best thing, I think, when people talk about it. Um, you talking about the sport professionally, though, you're commentating, you're doing the MMA Island interviews. How has training helped you uh, become a better talker, become a better commentator, be be become a better interviewer? I, you know, if I didn't practice it, I really don't think I could preach it. I really don't think if, you know... I have the wonderful opportunity to sit next to Joe Lozon every day. Well, during every CES match uh, show. And, you know, we talk about how, you know, we we walk the walk and we get to talk the talk. And it's it's so exciting. Obviously, I'm not even going to pretend I'm on Joe Lozon's level. <laughs> but it's it's just, it's so cool to be able to sit with somebody that gets it. And I really don't know if I'd be able to keep up with Joe Lozon and our fellow host Mike Parenti if I didn't practice it like you know there's there's so many people that are just huge fans of the sport that watch at home and are very intelligent and probably know what's going on but if you don't practice it there's probably these little nuances that you're missing or maybe you don't understand why they're doing something that allows me or Joe or Mike to like really dive into, um, which I think ele elevates our our commentary because it's not just, oh, that was a nice kick and like, oh, I hope he throws that overhand again. Like, no, we're gonna we're gonna break down like, okay, here's why he's throwing that jab more, or here's why he's setting up the body kick or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, the fact that I train was everything. For me, it had to have come first because I don't think I would have gotten that opportunity. Yeah. Being a, a striker um, yourself, I really enjoy striking as well. I don't know. I didn't know a ton about jujitsu. Like I knew enough about wrestling being a wrestler, but I didn't know that much about jujitsu. My first commentating like gig, uh, I was sitting next to a guy who loved jujitsu. Like that's, that's, you know, he lived and breathed jujitsu. And I thought like I knew enough to just maybe get by, just maybe talk enough about jujitsu. But like, he's like, yeah, on the ground, you want to look for this. He's looking for this, you know, trying to, you know, sink in the guillotine by baiting something over here and I was just like silent as he was talking I was like yeah, yeah. I believe you man <laughs> when you yeah what he said yeah exactly and uh with you being a striker as well was it like that for you at all when you were kind of first starting getting in there compared to when you were yeah, seeing someone and who knows everything about jujitsu it seems like totally I mean I'll, I'll be honest with you it's still kind of like that sometimes and I I have a good grasp of what's going on but when it comes to, like I said before, like here's why they're doing it, mm -hmm. I'm not quite there yet, which kind of changes my take on commentary when it comes to the ground game. And that's why 
I love working with Joe because if you're a fan of Joe Lozon, you know that his ground game is top notch. He loves that aspect of MMA. So we balance each other very well because I tend to analyze the striking a little more. He tends to analyze the ground game a little bit more. And it just puts me to the test of like commentary skills because it's really cool when, you know, I'm talking my game about like, oh, that was so awesome. And then they go to the ground and I'm like, okay, how am I going to contribute to this conversation? (laughs) (laughs) And and you kind of just learn how to like set Joe up. And, um, but it's, I feel like I'm on the fast track of learning because I'm watching it firsthand and I'm just learning so much about that game. And now that I'm practicing jujitsu, things are clicking very quickly. So I, I, I commend Joe for his knowledge and I thank him and a lot of other people in that world that have taken the time to allow me in this world and allow me to learn while I'm doing it. And I just feel like, you know, things are starting to click more and it's all it's all a learning process, you know. Absolutely, you know that's uh, I say absolutely so much. I just realized that as I. Um, I do too. It's good. <laughs> um, you're like you're super accomplished in uh, the MMA back end work as far as like commentating, as far as interviewing people. Obviously, you're working with CES. Uh, you've done some stuff with Bellator, which is badass, uh, and you're doing MMA Island. Um, how did you all get into this? Like, what was like your first, you know, into the industry? I like, I know you were fighting, but like, did someone just say, Hey, do you want to commentate one day? How did that all work? So it's, it's the, like, it's the crazy world of like, you got to know people. And I, and I hate that that's a thing, but sometimes it is. And I was at that point in, I want to say, I started getting really serious about broadcasting. I want to say in like 2018. Um, I had been working in radio since 2015 and I was grinding through that, started getting into television a little more with like lifestyle shows, which was wonderful. But I knew that my passion was martial arts and I knew that that's the road that I wanted to take. So I started working for free a lot. I would do the lace of promotions I talked about before. I would, um, help schedule those and run those shows but I would also take the time to like interview the fighters and uh, take video and just basically like get my reps in Um, and the CEO of the company Amir Abdallah took the noticed took notice and he directly works with Badu Jack um, who is a boxer um, based in Dubai and it's called Badu Jack Promotions and he actually he approached me and said hey do you want to commentate? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> um, he was like, yeah, do you want to commentate in Dubai? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like, I, like, I was like, are you sure? Um, and side note, my husband is a professional fighter. So he was making his second professional fight. So he was fighting in Dubai. I got to commentate for the very first time. And it was so thrilling, so exciting. And I truly, truly thank Amir for giving me that chance and like seeing my potential. So that kind of catapulted me. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, when you're in the middle here, let me just ask this. You didn't have to yeah. commentate for your husband, did you? I did. Oh, no. And that, that was horrible. hard. Yeah. Because in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, Maddie, you have to be biased people don't know that this is your husband and even if they do like you have to just be linear like don't don't make noises don't do anything (laughs) and it was hard but it was a really cool lesson you know because it was one of my favorite moments in the world i don't know if i i don't know if you can see it but i have no damn maybe if i you can kind of see it. that's me interviewing him that's so cool in the ring after after the fight um So, yeah, that was insanely hard. He ended up winning by um, knockout, but it was it was crazy. Um, So, yeah, that was a really cool learning curve. But then I came back. The fire was lit. I was like, this is awesome. I want to do this all the time. Uh, 2020 happens. And I'm like, "Okay, that kind of sucks. But that's when CES came around and I actually started with the boxing side. They had this awesome show outside um, in a stadium. And a good friend of mine, Ed Brady, who is a town selectman, um, 
was very good friends with the Birchfields who own CES. And I reached out to him and I said, hey, how do I get involved with this? He immediately set me up with an interview with them, kicked it off right away. And they were like, yeah, you can commentate. I'm like, this is amazing. So, you know, like I got my first shot there and then I just kept proving myself and just, you know, it was a lot of working for free at the beginning. And I tell a lot of people that because I think it's important that if you are truly passionate about something, you're going to do whatever it takes to get to that next level. And sometimes that means working for free and it means getting your reps in. And without that exposure that I gave myself or that work that I put in at the beginning, I don't think I'd be where I am today. And I'm not even close to where I want to be yet. But it's those moments where it's like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm doing this for free or like I'm working so hard and nobody's noticing. And then all of a sudden you're commentating for CES, you're working, you're doing things with MMA Island. Like it was one of those things where I just trusted the process. And in 2020, Chris DeSantiago, the former owner of MMA Island, reached out to me and he said, hey, love your stuff. And he's just a wonderful person. He's only like 19. Chris, I'm sorry if that's wrong, but he's like he's very young. Like this dude's not even 21. And he created this incredible incredible platform uh, for MMA. So I was so excited to hop on board with him. And so that's been a great, you know, great avenue as well. And that's helped get my name out a lot as well. And it's just been a wild ride. And I have a lot of plans for this year. And I just got to stay motivated. So it's going to be it's gonna be awesome. Congratulations. That's really cool to hear. Um, with MMA Island, I was super interested in that because it seemed like one day no one knows what MMA Island is. And then the next day, everyone knows what MMA Island is. Like it's just, I know. I, you know, overnight, everyone is, this is just a really good media source for MMA. Um, is that all you guys do is media? Or are there other things you guys are doing there as well? Because I'm not a hundred percent sure on everything they do. So there's, there's going to be a lot of new announcements coming this year about MMA Island, but the, primarily, it actually started as a meme page that Chris was all about, and uh, it caught a lot of traction just because of that. And then he wanted it to be a little more serious, and that's when I came on board in 2020 as like a journalist. And since then, it's just been skyrocketing. And uh, it has a new owner, Kevin, and he's wonderful. He's really motivated to make it even bigger than before by including now new branches. So it's always been MMA Island, but now we're looking into uh, K1 racing. We're looking into football. We're looking into so many other types of sports um, that will be under one umbrella, one like major company that Kevin is starting to put together. So um that's all going to be coming to fruition this year, I believe. Um, but my bread and butter is the MMA Island, and I've been loving it. It's incredible to watch it grow, and it's it's been a real treat to be at the beginning, since the beginning. Yeah. Um, one thing when it comes to journalism is it's changed so much over the past even five years. You know, like uh, I remember when, you know, someone was getting interviewed, uh, you know, a uh, journalist would put a recorder in their face, ask them a couple of questions, write an article, and you would never hear the interview. Nowadays, it's like you do the interview, that gets posted, and, you know, sometimes an article is never written. Do you guys do mm. articles still, or is it just kind of interviews? Because I see you interviewing a ton and some really awesome people. They do. They do do articles every so often, um, and I believe the website is being built. Um, so, they're going to try and create a more user-friendly website with a lot more articles. Um, and that's the cool part about the team growing is that a lot of these team members, we all have different roles. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the guys are the, are the writers. Some of the guys are the interviewers. Uh, they, we have a great MMA Island podcast. The, the boys of the podcast are phenomenal. Uh, they're super fun. Uh, so yeah, the, I think the journalistic side with the writing is still very important, but I think it's safe to say that a lot of people are interested in the visuals now and MMA Island has really capitalized on that with just getting the fighters and just important people in front of the people. Um, and I think, you know, hardcore fans will read, fans will watch and everybody will at least watch. So I think it's important to 
kind of keep up with with that trend yeah um i see uh i see you guys seem to hop on uh getting these interviews when the fighters are really at the peak of fame for example you did an interview with a kickboxer uh she was on instagram you know like going really viral and stuff like that yeah and you seem to have her on like i don't know a week later two weeks later um w- what's the strategy behind getting these people at such a high point in their career because i'm sure their dms have to be flooded yeah, well, I think, you know, that that's just a testament to what Chris and Kevin have done with the uh, with our images. When you see MMA Island pop into your DMs, you're going to pay attention. And I think that speaks volumes to what we have done in the past few years. And having our team grow really helps as well because we're attacking people from all sides. You know, it's that, you know, Sammy Joe is the the girl you're referencing and she had a really funny moment on Twitter and come to find out she's a really good kickboxer and she's very attractive. And we were like, okay, boom, done. We're going to interview. And uh, it's just one of those things where, yeah, her DMs were probably blowing up, but she saw the MMA Island logo and was like, okay, sounds good. Um, You know, there are times where I will go personally with my page into somebody's DMs and be like, hey, you know, from MMA Island, I also have my own YouTube channel. Like, are you interested? And sometimes they go on red, but it's all about shooting your shot. Um, there's plenty of people that we, I have reached out to, they have reached out to that we don't hear back from. Um, but it's all about shooting your shot. And luckily, we've made a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And then uh, with um, these people you guys are interviewing as well, you conduct the interviews in a very professional manner, very you know well-run manner. Um, when you're doing these interviews with like higher level people, do they ever tell you there's like off topic things? For example, I mean, if you were to interview James Krause right now, I'm sure he's not going to want to talk about anything that's going on. Is that ever like a struggle for you guys? Um, well, I can only speak for myself on that end. And I think as a journalist, it's important to ask the important questions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those questions are very uncomfortable. And I think what makes a good journalist is asking the uncomfortable questions because it forces the person that you're interviewing to either answer it, which you hope they will, or they'll say, I'm not going to talk about that right now. And you move on and that's it. Um, I think, you know, people are always so worried. At least I feel like a lot of reporters have a fear of messing up or, or looking silly or maybe, you know, getting a back talk from, from who they're talking to, but guess what? That gets views. And, you know, like I, I'm trying to remember of an example where I think I asked a fighter, I think I asked a fighter about something and it wasn't him. It was the wrong fighter. <laughs> oh, geez. He was like, that's not even me. Uh-huh. And I was like, Oh, well, you know, <laughs> and, you know, you may, you just, you just make it a joke, you know? Um, but when it comes to like, no, I can't talk about that. I make them say that to me, you know, like I will ask you like, Hey, let's talk about it. Yeah. And then they'll just be like, no. And it's like, all right. Anyway. And you just, you know, you just kind of move on from it. Now on the other end though, like if, if say like we're scheduling and they're like, Hey, don't ask me about this. Okay. Won't ask you about it. Right. But if that conversation never happens, Game on. <laughs> Game on. <laughs> um, you were at Bellator. I, I, I hope I'm right in this. You were at the Rafion Sabatello fight, correct? Yes. Oh, my gosh. It was wild. What was, was that wild. like? Because I'm a huge Rafion fan. I wish I could have been there. That was so cool. The energy in the room was really cool because the room was so divided. Like, half of the crowd was for Stotts. Half of the crowd was for Sabatello. And it was just, I really thought that Stotts was going to come out and everybody was going to be for him. But there was like a lot of people there that wanted, you know, the mean guy to win. And it just made it so entertaining. And like the fact that it went all five rounds and, you know, the crowd was just insane. It it was it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, MMA is awesome. Like live MMA is so much fun. And then like, you know, having it be a split decision. It was just like poetry, you know, it was just, it was great. Yeah. What, what did you think about the decision? Because I, I, I thought like, okay, I, th- I think that one could have gone either way. I would assume that most people would agree on that. But when you look yeah. at the stats of the fight, I think Rafion won, but I think the stats and watching the fight are like two different stories because 
watching the fight, I thought Sabatella won, but then looking at the stats, I thought, uh, uh, or sorry, no, Vice, no, 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 I said that right. I thought, looking at the stats, sorry, I, looking at the stats, I thought Rafian won, and then looking at the fight, I thought Sabatella won, so I thought that could have gone either way, and then there's a 50-45, and it was just so controversial. Yeah, I mean, the judging has been kind of, there was a couple of fights that night where I was like, I'm sorry, what? But that fight was very close, and I think this is the, you know, the classic case of what do you weigh more? Like, do you weigh ground game more? Do you weigh aggressiveness more? And I know that there's an outline that judges are supposed to follow, but sometimes if you have a judge that likes to see a lot of on the ground, then they're probably going to favor that more. I think overall, I do think Stotts won. I think he was more aggressive, more busy. Sabatello did a great job on the ground, um, but Stotts had a lot of great takedown defenses. Yeah. And I, I think I think they both looked great, but I think Sabatello is just not quite there. I think he just needs a couple more reps of big fights like that. I, I don't think that this is going to hurt his career in the slightest. I think he looked great. I just don't think it's his time. I think Stotts was just a little smarter and a little more aggressive. Like every shot that he landed, it was like, Pez dispenser. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I like that. I, Pez I think, dispenser. I think, I like that. Yeah, I just, I, I think, I think the judges had it right. I think the scoring was a little off, but I think they had the right winner. Yeah, and I, I agree with you because I think um, Danny Sabatello, what I think he was four for nineteen on takedowns, proving that Rafian had really good takedown defense. But on those four takedowns, he had what? What was it? Like ten minutes and one second of control time, but. That again, yeah. when he had that control time, he wasn't doing anything. Like Rafian was still right. going for the straight locks or the straight leg right. locks and all that kind of stuff. So it was really interesting. And and the stand up, I think anyone's going to say that Rafian won that fight, which I think as well. Yeah, and I think that you nailed it with that one. It's like, yeah, you did a great job. You did a great job keeping him down, but what did you do with it? You didn't do anything. You weren't you weren't trying to submit him. You weren't like, you know. I mean, obviously, it's easier to say all this while watching, and you know, you're not doing it, but. He just didn't do enough with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, 10 minutes, like, that's very impressive. But how many times did you go for anything? I, I just, I didn't think he did enough. Yeah. What, uh, I agree with you. Um, what were you doing at Bellator? Were you commentating? Because I didn't hear you on the mainstream, but I assumed you were there with no, MMA so, Island. So I was with MMA Island. Okay. I, we were on uh, Media Row, and we, I was with my friend Chris there. And Chris was kind of taking care of the, you know, uh, post-fight interviewing. I was handling the social media that night so i was doing a lot of stuff on the story and yeah it's just another one of those cool perks you get when you work with uh mma island and doing stuff like that so um i would love to work with bellador bellator with just them one day i mean that would be amazing uh i've i've put my name in the hat a few times so i'll just keep i'll just keep bugging them (laughs) until they answer me um in uh, 2023, big year, obviously, it just started. Uh, you're saying you have a lot of stuff you're working on, a lot of aspirations you're chasing. Um, are you able to leak any of those? Like, what, some big things coming on for you? Yeah, I mean, there's really nothing in the books. I just, I, like I said, I, you know, at the end of last year, I went through some health stuff, and I went through some family stuff, and I really slowed down on journaling and being a journalist. And putting myself out there. I really kind of secluded myself from the whole world to just deal with what I was dealing with. And I'm coming into this new year feeling very optimistic, very excited, very enthusiastic. And I have a lot of goals. And, you know, I started my YouTube channel last year, kind of let it slide a little bit because of what I was going through, but I'm ready to like hit the ground running with it again and really get those numbers up again. Um, So I'm really excited to do that and just putting more content out in general and like have that content be my living and breathing resume. And, you know, CES is wonderful, but I'm, I'm ready to like go to that next level, like LFA or, or something along those lines of just continuing to grind and getting my name out there and showing people that, you know, like I I have what it takes and you need to get me on your team, (laughs) you know? Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this year as a grinding year. I said this before, I am looking at this year as being comfortable with the uncomfortable. I'm going to do things that scare me. I'm going to do things that uh, the old Maddie might not have. 
and it, it scares the shit out of me, but I'm, uh, I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing the big things you're going to do. Uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, you know, I'm a really big yeah. fan of what you're doing. It really, uh, really means a lot. Thank you. Yeah, no, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for having me.